from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. We are rolling. I have to do a little quick introduction. Okay. Uh, my name is Joe Munier of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm with videographer John Bishop. We are in St. Augustine, Florida. Today is Tuesday, the 13th of September, 2011. We are at the Bayfront Hilton in St. Augustine to do a series of interviews related to local civil rights history um, for the Civil Rights History Project, which is a joint undertaking of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. John Bishop, I think we are not recording to... Um, we are recording. We are recording to the XD cards. Back. Okay, we have those back. Um, do you need any room tone? No, we are okay on that. Okay, any other housekeeping? Nope. Think not, okay. Um, we're delighted today to be able to sit down with you, Ms. Duncan. Um, uh, our interviewee is Ms. Gwendolyn Annette Perkins Duncan, um, and we will talk about local civil rights history and her involvements uh, that are ongoing still even today. Um, thank you very much for your generous willingness to sit down and also your flexibility because I know we've had to juggle our day today, so thank you for that. You're welcome. Yeah. Let me ask you just to, and I think we'll probably spend about a half an hour together so we can kind of pace ourselves that way. Um, I wonder if you can start by talking a little bit about your family and it's how, how it's situated here um, historically in, in St. Augustine and how you've, how you've all had your various involvements in, in the movement and its legacy. Okay, I'll start off. My name is Gwendolyn Annette Duncan and um, I was born and raised in Lincolnville of St. Augustine, Florida, June 28, 1956. I'm a fifth generation native my great grandfather my great great grandfather thomas a finley lived in saint augustine and in lincolnville i was told that he moved from the carolinas it took many years for them to get here and i used to often wonder from a child why would they come so far to saint augustine what was the driving force to lead this family to come finley is a surname to St. Augustine. And later in life, I learned why. But my great-great-grandfather, he had 13 children. Some were born along the way coming to St. Augustine in South Carolina, Georgia, mm -hmm. and eventually he ended up in uh, Moultrie, which is just south of St. Augustine, St. John's County. And I was told that, and we did the research, that he had about 13 acres and was a farmer. Now his daughter, which was my great-grandmother, Abby Finley, she, she married a Hillman, Al, Abby Finley Hillman. She bought some land in Lincolnville. And the St. Augustine record, which did not mention black people often, made mention of his 89th, uh, he died at 89 years of age. And they said he served the white community well. That was in the newspaper. We all just like, we were, what he was, he brought his wares from Moultrie to St. Augustine, the city of, and eventually moved in Lincolnville with my great grandmother. She was a founder of St. Cyprian's Episcopal Church, which has been in Lincolnville for maybe over 150 years now. My mother, my mother's grandmother, Elizabeth, no, that was Abby. She um, lived right directly across from the church which they built. And it's still, uh, it has half a congregation right even to this day. Uh, it was fun growing up in Lincolnville. Things were segregated, but you know, as a child, you really didn't know what segregation was all about until you ventured off in downtown areas. But growing up in Lincolnville, like I said, it was great. There were many businesses along the way because of the segregation. You know, you had your own grocery stores. You had the beauty parlors. There were bars along the street on Washington Street. There were uh, 
had newspaper publishers. Uh, you know, everything you needed was in Lincolnville. And the church was a center of activity. They had the church socials, picnics, everything centered around the church. And uh, I am one of eight girls. My mother had eight girls, no eight boys. Girls. And uh, so I guess it was kind of, you know, the house was situated for women <laughs> and young girls, not my, my stepfather who uh, was the only man in the house, but a hardworking man. And I thank the Lord, you know, for my great grandmother. I knew her. She died at probably at about 89 or 90 years of age as well. She died before my grandmother, my mother's mother died. And, and she died in November of 1963, same month that uh, President Kennedy was shot. I can remember that happening. But I know you want to talk about the civil rights movement. What I remember most from a child at seven and a half years old when Dr. King came to St. Augustine was the marches by the Ku Klux Klan. From a child's point of view, everybody through Lincolnville. dressed through Lincolnville. Yeah. From a child's point of view, and you didn't know what was happening, uh, you thought it was some big parade that you wanted to participate in. You know, it was just, you know, it was a parade to me. But I can recall, you know, at night there was a, a time of terror. And um, I remember one night in particular, I guess all the black people came out. Uh, I was a little child, but I can remember, you know, black people lying in the streets and the Ku Klux Klan marching through the area. And we went down on the corner of the Haven and Central Avenue, which is now Martin Luther King Avenue. And, I, and we watched the marches and marched through our area. And I can remember as we were walking home, my mom holding my, one of my sister's hands in mine. And she said, don't look back. I could just remember the terror of don't look back, keep walking. And um, some of my classmates, you know, at Excelsior, some of their homes on the other street were bombed, firebombed. But I can remember something sticks out in my mind about a bad cop. And I used to think that bad cop furniture store, they were bad people. But it, it was like this bad cop I would hear from a child's point of view, bad cops. You didn't trust the bad cop, you know? And uh, I remember one morning, you know, my mom was on the porch, she was combing hair. And Dr. King must have, he was staying across the street to Mr. Proctor's house. And I don't know if he stayed there that night, all I know is he came across the street to ask my mom if she was gonna participate in the rally or the marches that night. And that, and I used to always think it was like a faded memory. I asked my mom when I got older, did that actually happen? Because I remember it happening, you know? And she said it did, you know. You know, you have these faded memories, you know, you have to verify. But um, as I grew older, and that's about 10, 11, 12, when you had to venture off downtown, that was the only time I really experienced, uh, you know, this segregation, going in a store and people watching you like you were gonna take something or steal something. And I can remember the, cause everything was in walking distance. Downtown was not far away. It was less than two miles, less than a mile. But I can remember the doctor's building in Flagler Hospital was around the corner. And the, the doctor's building on Trimington Street, I can remember a colored sign being up on the wall when you walk through the front door. And as you, it was right to the right. I mean, I can see that sign even now. But the memory is I can also, you know, remember it coming down. But we would have to go to the right and go around to the back of the doctor's office. And there was a straight hallway when you walked through the door that you could not tread. And I was always wondering what was down that hallway. You know, that's the way I wanted to go. But the sign, the colored sign pointed to the way that I should go. But I can remember that sign coming down, and although they painted over where that sign was, the spot where it was was still, it was, you still could see the spot. So when it came down, I thought, you know, when I took my sister, one of my younger sisters to the doctor, because my mom would be working and my stepfather as well, but I had to take her to the doctor's office because although I was a second from the oldest, I, I was given a lot of responsibility, I guess, because I was, my mom always said, beyond my years. And I remember, I said, well, that sign is down. I'm gonna go straight down this hallway, which was forbidden before. And I walked down there and my little sister and we entered in the doctor's office. And 
Everybody looked at you as though you had a communicable disease. You know, when you walked through that door, I can just remember that feeling. But, um, and I went to the front, put my name down for my sister, and she needed to see the doctor, and we sat down. And to my surprise, they called us first. And I thought, oh, great, we won't have to wait that long. But then they marched us back through that office, back to the back side where we used to come in the back. And if, if I followed your timing correct, <clears throat> you, if you're 10 or 12 at the time, mm -hmm. this is well past, of course, the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Yes. This is 66, 67, yes. 68. Yes, yes. I couldn't remember the exact year, but I do remember the sign when it came down. And as I grew older, you know, you don't understand from a child's point of view what is happening all around you. Yet I remember uh, being in the fifth grade and I completed my fifth grade year at Excelsior Elementary School. And in the sixth grade, we had to go, it was forced integration. So our school closed down and we had to go to Orange Street School. And I could recall the teachers not w wanting to teach you, you know, it was, uh, and the kids not wanting to sit by you. But I felt good about myself because I was not, you know, I guess I, I had some good self-esteem. And, um, and I was a smart, you know, don't brag, just fact, you know, I was a smart child, you know, I probably would have been valedictorian if the, if, uh, the schools remained black, you know, or salutatorian of my class. But I can remember going to being forced to go to the, the schools and and we had to fight. It looked like uh, it wasn't nonviolence. It was, we had to fight even to eat, you know? Uh, you the teachers didn't want to teach you. And uh, and you felt a sense of a second class citizen, which I never felt being in the area of Lincolnville when it was segregated, you know? But and I didn't like that feeling. And uh, so I even to, through my teen years, going to the junior high school, uh, the junior high school didn't even have a cafeteria. So you had to walk back to Orange Street just to eat. And the white kids would form a line, you know, to prevent you from going to eat your lunch, you know. So it was a, it was a lot of violence back then. I remember in the teens, you know, in the junior high and the high school. Um, it wasn't nonviolence, you know. People were fighting, you know, just fighting just to, um, like I said, just to eat lunch, you know, because you were not wanted and they made you feel that way. You were not wanted at those schools. But Lord bless, and, you know, we were able to get on and graduate even through St. Augustine High School, but you still felt that atmosphere of not being a part of the city in which you grew up in. Uh, my kids experienced it too, you know, and there is an atmosphere still here in this town. Um, Mrs. Kerry Johnson refers to it as like a, a hidden vapor, you know, uh, over this town. But I thank the Lord for the Twines. I thank the Lord for Dr. Halen. I learned about him later in, in life as I grew up. And um, but there was an opportunity after one of my friends, Mrs. Catherine Twine, died. She she would tell us bits and pieces about the civil rights movement and uh, I felt that because I, I, I lived through it, you know, the signs being up and they're and they coming down. But David Nolan, after her internment in 2002, he and J.T. Johnson from Atlanta, Georgia, Jane Billingsley Brown, she was a professor at one of the schools, I think it was Spelman in Atlanta. Uh, David Nolan, as I said, Miss Carrie Johnson, Dwight, um, I think I can't remember his la last name, Dwight Hines, I believe it was, Sandra Parks, they all met at a restaurant, South Seas, over on the island, and they discussed the upcoming 40th anniversary of the Civil Rights Movement of St. Augustine. And David Nolan, who was a local historian, asked me to put on my thinking cap to come up with some ideas of how we could commemorate or celebrate this event. And so when I got that email, I um, told my husband about it, and he said, yeah, we'll help, you know, we'll, we'll do what we can. So I emailed him back and I said, whatever you want me to do, 
I'll do it. I said, we can base this celebration, this commemoration on a family reunion and invite all these people who had participated in the movement back to St. Augustine. Because in 2001, we had a family, our first Finley family reunion in which we invited people from all around the country, you know, back to St. Augustine for a family reunion. And David Nolan took part in that. And uh, I just want to mention, too, that we found one of, my daughter did gene genealogy research, and we found one of our cousins who was the ambassador of Madagascar under President Clinton's administration. We found her all the way over there in Africa, Madagascar, the island on the side. But it was such a wonderful time, a joyous time, until I thought that would be a great thing to invite these people back to hear their stories, their incredible stories of their participation, because we, as we learned about the Civil Rights Movement, we know a lot of them left the city. So Ms. Kara Johnson and I set up a meeting at the Gallimore Center, and uh, we put it in the paper and invited people to come for a strategic meeting to see if there was any interest in, you know, having this commemoration, which was to take place in a couple of years. And we were amazed that older people came out and they began to share their stories. They were incredible stories. Some of them were heart-wrenching stories. Some just, I mean, uh, it was just tearjerkers hearing what these, the terror that these people went through during that era of the Civil Rights Movement led by Dr. Healy and Dr. King. And uh, so from that meeting on, we decided we're going to we're going to just bring these people back to St. Augustine, invite them and so they can tell their stories and, you know, just get together and not necessarily uh, have a joyous time, but commemorate and remember and recognize what happened in St. Augustine because it was, it was hidden. It was hidden by the power structure of St. Augustine who didn't want to acknowledge that something like that ever happened. I remember one meeting we had at, uh, it was on DeSoto Place, and J.T. Johnson would come in, and he, he flew in from Atlanta, and we invited him to come. And there was a demonstrator sitting in the audience, and he said, why don't you all let sleeping dogs lie? Why bring this up again? Just leave it alone, let it go. And J.T. Johnson stood up, and he said, it's just time to just say thank you. And that struck me even to this day. And we just wanted to say thank you. We wanted to bring these people back and just say thank you for the sacrifices that you made for us. I know it probably was disappointing, you know, to some of them who fought so much, you know, to make life better for the next generation and generations after to come back and see things had not changed much here in St. Augustine. Uh, St. Augustine at one point didn't appreciate its black history. I learned later in life that, um, that the first free black settlement in the United States was Fort Mose, you know, and that made me know why my ancestors came so far and risked so much to come to this place of sanctuary because it was a sanctuary for blacks at one point. But things have changed. They're not the same even now, and it makes me want to cry. It brings me to tears to know that uh, all that Dr. Haling fought for, all that Dr. Martin Luther King did here in this town, that some things still remain the same. But, and I will wipe my tears away, I am so thankful, I am so uh, grateful for the sacrifices made by these people. I want them to know that their sacrifice was not in vain for me. I have five children, excuse me. I have five children and we stress education, that they must get a good education in order to survive in this world. But I have a son, uh, Zebulon Duncan, who graduated with an engineering degree from the University of Florida, industrial engineering degree in systems engineering, got a bachelor's degree. And he came back to this town seeking a job and could not find a job. He was even uh, qualified to, treat, to teach ge geometry, trigonometry, all of these high math courses, but he could not get a job in this city. 
So he went back to school and got his uh, master's degree in building and construction and still couldn't get a job in this city. He wrote something that really touched my heart not too long ago and put it on online that the city that he loved will never be the city that he will come back to ever again. And this has been, this has been the norm for a lot of black people here in this, in this city. I'm just gonna tell the truth you know, about it. Um, St. Augustine needs to change. And the change is gonna come and I don't know who's gonna make those changes. Maybe it'll be the young people who come back to make changes here. But um, about the Civil Rights Movement and the 40th Accord, it has been a pleasure, it has been an honor these last eight years to bring recognition and honor to these folks, to enlighten the public about what happened here, the struggles that these people faced just, you know, for the basic human rights. And uh, I just thank God, our uh, organization, the 40th Accord, there are no paid employees. Nobody gets paid. And for a number of years, we weren't even funded, you know, but in the Northrop Grumman Corporation, thank God, they, um, they decided to give us a chance and they funded 30 historic civil rights markers in and around the city. And I thank God that some city officials allowed this to happen. And uh, some private citizens offered and gave us permission to put these markers, these historic markers in their yard to tell the stories, because there are many, there are numerous stories of the sacrifices made by just local citizens and those who came from afar, you know, to help with this movement. And uh, I'm, I'm just um, glad to be a part, you know, of bringing recognition to people sure. like Dr. Robert Haley, sure. uh, the St. Augustine Pool, Arjanelle Edwards, and Joanne Anderson Elmer. We have a lady who's a hunt, she'll be 107 years old this year, who gave, her name is Mrs. Rena Ayers, who gave lodging and food to the many demonstrators who came from the North, to attorneys who came from the North to defend them in the courts. And um, it is our hope that um, this knowledge of this American history is known not only in the United States, but afar as well, around the world. Um, so if uh, anybody watches this 50, 60, 70 years from today, they'll know that there, there was some great people that walked among us, angels I call them, and uh, their sacrifices will not go in vain. And I want my children to know about it, my grandchildren to know. I want everyone to know what happened here in St. Augustine, Florida. Let me ask you kind of a hard question, which is, which is, what are the things that haven't changed that are the problems now as you line them up and, and see them in the, in the city around you? Um, there are not a lot of jobs and opportunities for blacks here in St. Augustine. Uh, if you went up and down the streets, you probably wouldn't even find, you probably could count on your hand the black businesses, and I doubt if one hand would cover it. There was a loss of jobs. Um, doubt if one hand wouldn't cover it, probably. Yeah, one yeah. hand probably right. wouldn't, uh, right. you know, cover those jobs, I mean, you know, those businesses. Right. Um, there's not a lot of blacks in the city government. There's not a lot of blacks even in any type of, um, you know, administration and power here in St. Augustine, to me, you know, in St. John's County. And uh, a lot of people have just left this, the city. The young people have left, and I don't know if they will return. Like your son. Like mm -hmm. your son as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But he doesn't live that far away. He's yeah. right over in Jacksonville. Yeah. And, um, you know, his wife is a, a, a professional, an internal, medicine. She uh, has an MD in internal medicine. Um, I have a daughter who has a doctorate degree in physical therapy, but she, she's here in St. Augustine. She has a job now, but uh, she's looking to go elsewhere. And she just came back here a few months ago from Ocala, Florida. Mm -hmm. And she's thinking about moving to Hawaii for a little while and, you know, just seeing the United States. Mm -hmm. But um, if we can get job opportunities back here, 
I think uh, there, there will be a change made in St. Augustine. Yeah. Tell me, I'm, I'm interested in the, in the reaction to the placement of the Freedom Trail markers. Well, um, and the range of reaction maybe is the right way to ask the question. Well, they're like, uh, as Ambassador Young said, they're like weeds growing up, uh, you know. Um, I guess the atmosphere now is better than it used to be, I can even say two or three years ago. There is a demand to know about the history. There are tourists coming in asking about the uh, civil rights movement. Some didn't even know it was a movement here and when they heard about it through I guess crossing in St. Augustine and Ambassador Young did, that brought a lot of recognition to the movement. Uh, some didn't even know Dr. King even came, but um, I think now the with the new city manager, um, you know, the attitude with Ambassador Young coming, that um, the attitude has changed uh, a little bit, and I guess the once history that was covered up by the city is now being embraced because they see, and I'm thinking because it's the money maker, you know? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I believe the dollars, the revenue that can be generated is the driving factor do you think now. That, do you think that that's ultimately the calculation that motivated the city's willingness to place the trail markers and the foot soldiers monuments? rather than a more sort of a deeper moral transformation? I mean, I know you can't really know the answer for mm -hmm. sure, but. Well, um, the Foot Soldiers Monument, yeah. that was a private venture. Yeah. I mean, the city took credit after it was, yeah. you know, the money was there and, you know, but. Uh, but at least they sort of, if they weren't welcoming, at least they didn't do what all that they could have to stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. I can say that, I guess. I think uh, the wheels were turning and then it just wasn't going to stop. Yeah. I mean, people were going to keep coming, mm -hmm. you know. And like I said, a lot of people that gave us permission were private citizens to put those markers on, in their yards. Um, right, right. But the city, I guess the attitudes have changed somewhat. Mm -hmm. And you know, with the advent of the, uh, Ambassador Young coming back here mm -hmm. and previewing his movie, that that, I mean, really things took off after that. Just more exposure. Yes, yeah. more very much. It was national exposure. How do you how do you evaluate the motives of Northrop Grumman? Well, you know what? I just I'm gonna attribute that to just God's blessings because I had wrote a letter to the management there asking for funding you know, to help with the commemorations, the recognitions, services that we were having, and uh, it fell in the right hands. That's what I, I say. Um, the Lord just blessed mm -hmm. and opened up their hearts because the history shows that uh, Fairchild Hiller, the company that was previously there, they were not very friendly to the civil rights demonstrators, all the blacks that were employed there. Uh, and I, I attribute it to the people coming from the north. You know, the attitudes were not the same as those that were here in the south. We're back after a <coughs> brief, just a very brief pause to um, change recording tracks. No, it's okay. Okay. Um, Ms. Duncan, let me, let me ask you for, you've been so patient to accommodate our crazy schedule today. Um, and I, th this history runs so broad and deep, it's, it's hard to, to have just a, a s relatively small amount of time. But I want to ask you, are there other things when you tell this story and help people understand St. Augustine, other things that we should spend some time talking about, themes, episodes, incidents? Well, St. Augustine, I'm telling you, it is a great little town. I mean, it, I always thought it was a wonderful place to raise a family because it's quiet. You know, after being, being in New York City, you know, just visiting, I would not want to raise kids in, in, in New York City. St. Augustine was a, is a quiet town, a peaceful town, but as uh, Hank Thomas said, it is paternalistic, as though we need caring for, you know, as though we can't take care of ourselves, you know. But um, it's a tourist town. And um, 
They need to bring some more industry into the city. I could see the city of St. Augustine remaining old and, you know, uh, historic, but the county itself needs to open up to industry where people will come back and blacks will be, it'll be a place that they can come and raise their families like it used to be. I would like to see it like it used to be. Yeah. It was good growing up in Lincolnville. It was good growing up in St. Augustine and they weren't, thousands of black people here. They have just taken flight out of this place. And I think something needs to be done to draw the people back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's next for 40th Accord? <clears throat> well, uh, we have um, an upcoming speaker. Uh, we always commemorate the anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Act. This past July, we had uh, Dr. Dorothy Cotton mm -hmm. come. She was our keynote speaker. and. Our guest speaker was Sonia Plummer. She was a granddaughter of one of the civil rights activists here, Reverend Goldie Eubanks. Uh, come July 2012, uh, we have uh, author Taylor Branch coming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that will be our signature event. The, uh, and we do Freedom Trail tours from time to time to educate the public and tourists who come who want to know about the history. Uh, and you help you help uh, with the whole series of um, materials and training for school teachers. Yes, we've done two workshops, and uh, we've get, gotten permission from the superintendent of schools, and we did two workshops uh, for the teachers of St. John's County, and it was wonderful. And we had one at St. Augustine High School. Dr. Halen was a speaker. We had brought in Miss Lily Antoine Robeson. Uh, it was numerous speakers to share their stories with the teachers. We put together a, a workbook um, of civil rights activities, pictures, documents for the teachers. The first year, Northrop Grumman funded it, and the, I guess two years later we did it again, and we put them on, you know, the, the workbook on a CD. But funding has been an issue, you know, for the 40th Accord and getting pro programs done because it wasn't a popular subject. And we sought state, federal, uh, you know, city, state, and county federal funds, but never were approved. If it wasn't for the Northrop Grumman, you know, this story would not have gotten out. So, um, but our, I guess our long-term goal is to establish a civil rights museum here in St. Augustine. That is, it's not just the 40th Accord. We have, uh, the 40th Accord started an organization uh, I guess a committee, and we had a meeting, and they decided to come up from under the umbrella of Accord because it's such a big uh, venture. And uh, we have the uh, chairman, Richard Burton, out of Jacksonville, who's a national NAACP board member. He's our chair, JT Johnson, co chair. We have the um, president of Flagler College on that committee, the mayor's on that committee, and uh, we're looking by 2014 to have something up and running. Not the multi-million dollar facility that Ambassador Young has uh, great hopes of uh, raising funds for, but something to celebrate and commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act in St. Augustine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's just been a great honor and privilege. I really want to thank you. and. Um, It'll be really great to watch all those plans move forward. Yes. So thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing. Thank you. And thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Wow. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.